welcome to the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association's Patients Come First podcast series, which can be heard on VHHA.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you get podcasts. We're a member of the Public Health Podcast Directory, the Virginia Audio Collective, and the Family Podcast Network. And you can listen to us on the radio each Saturday at noon and Sunday at 10 a.m. on 100.5 FM, 92.7 FM, 107.7 FM, and 8.20 a.m. across Central Virginia, and 16.50 a.m. in Hampton Roads, and Wednesdays at 1 p.m. on 93.9 FM in Richmond. Please send any questions, comments, or feedback to pcfpodcast at vhha.com. That's pcfpodcast at vhha.com. I'm Selena Lord with the VHHA team, and today we're excited to be joined by Dia Klein, a storyteller and performer, advocate, and chef who was born without the ability to smell. During our time together, we'll learn more about her personal journey, the condition of anosmia, the ways in which the COVID-19 pandemic has elevated issues related to loss of smell, and more. We'll jump into that in just a moment, but first, welcome to the podcast, Dia. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's start with a bit of level setting. You were born without the ability to smell a condition known as congenital anosmia, though you didn't actually realize your sense of smell was compromised until several years into childhood from what I've read. Among the U.S. population, about 3% of people have had no sense of smell or a very minimal sense of smell. Statistics also suggest that 1 in 5 Americans over age 40 report some sense of diminution in their sense of smell. With that bit of background, Dia, please tell us more about your condition, how you became aware of it, and how it impacts your life in ways that may not be apparent to people who have not lost their sense of smell. Ooh, I love it. A compound question. Okay, let's see if I can remember all of that. The first part is, of course, my anosmia story. And I first realized that there was this thing called smell and that I couldn't do it when I was four years old. And the memory of the incident is very clear in my mind. I remember walking into my house with my father and brother, and as soon as they opened the door, they both breathed in and exclaimed, oh, spaghetti for dinner. And I could not understand how they did that, because you couldn't see the kitchen from the front door. And so when I asked, how did they know we're having spaghetti for dinner, my father instructed me to breathe in through my nose and smell. Thus started the repeat of an incredibly unhelpful command on how to smell. Breathe in through your nose and smell. When I breathed in, all I got was warm air. And I didn't understand how warm air equated to spaghetti for dinner. And I kept reporting this to my parents, and they kept somewhat believing me, but not. And I just spent my entire childhood being told to just just breathe in and smell and nothing ever happened. And I was in the fourth grade when they took me to a doctor, an ENT, an otolaryngologist, otolaryngologist, oy, that's a name, <laughs> whatever the ENT <laughs> name is. And he looked up my nose and he was like, oh, well, it looks a little swollen up there. Eh, she'll grow into it. And when I reported that I could taste, his response was, well, if she can taste, she can smell which as we know now is incredibly bad science, not true. And I just kept going forward with, no, I I can taste, but I can't smell. And just having people not believe me. And that's been the somewhat struggle of my life is getting people to understand that smell and taste are connected, but they're not the same and that you can have one without the other. And just, you know, kind of live in my life as an unknown anosmic. And it wasn't until I was in my 40s, my daughter came home from a high school psychology class. And she said, I know exactly what you are. You're a congenital anosmic. And I'd never heard that term. I'd heard anosmia before, but anosmia didn't fit. Because when when you look up anosmia online, all you get are the acquired anosmic symptoms and diagnostic features. And it didn't fit. Because I didn't fit more than half of what they were saying anosmia was. And so she came home and put the word congenital in front of it. When I looked that up, I was like, bullseye, that is exactly who I am. And since that time, I've been moving forward, working as an advocate, raising awareness and educating people on congenital anosmia. That's my origin story. Do you wish you could focus on practicing medicine without all the distractions? Covaris is here to help. 
As a leader in medical professional liability insurance with more than 45 years experience, Coveris provides insurance protection with data-driven predictive modeling to help you mitigate the risk of claims. By combining insurance protection with risk analytic services, you can reduce distractions and focus on improving clinical, operational, and financial outcomes. Coveris is reinventing what you should expect from your medical professional liability provider. Find out all Coveris can offer you at Coveris.com. That's C-O-V-E-R-Y-S.com. Insurance products issued by Medical Professional Mutual Insurance Company and its insurance subsidiaries, Boston, Massachusetts. I mentioned a moment ago that you are, among other things, a chef. I wonder how lacking a sense of smell impacts your approach to cooking because taste and smell are so linked. For context, I should note that in preparing for this conversation, I watched a YouTube video in which you took a blindfolded food challenge that involved you and another person sampling food items that had been pureed to disguise their texture and guessing each item. You more than held your own in that challenge, so I'm curious about two things. How you compensate, if that's the appropriate word, or account for a lack of smell when you cook. And what message or lesson were you conveying in that YouTube video? Well, the message is simple, that people who can't smell can taste. That's the simple, most profound, biggest message that I can get across, is that just because I can't smell doesn't mean I can't taste. So, number one, boom, slap you across the face. I do many of those videos to prove that I can indeed taste. So, when I cook... I rely on a pure sense of taste. And the way I compare this is for people who can smell, your sense of taste is like the 96 box of Crayola brand crayons with the sharpener in the back. You got all the colors. You got the cool sharpener. Everything works for you. My sense of taste is like I show up with the off-brand box of 12. It's the same. It's just different. So when someone who can smell, when they describe and talk about taste. What they are not understanding is the differentiation between taste and flavor. And flavor is taste and smell put together. I clearly don't understand flavor in the sense of I don't have a sense of smell, but I can absolutely distinguish more than the five tastes because I can tell you the different brands of chocolate. I know that a kumquat is a different sour than a lemon than is a grapefruit. So when I cook, I realize that there are things that I can tell, but there are things that I can't. And the biggest thing I can't distinguish are herbs because herbs really live in the olfactory world. When you eat herbs, you're really having a flavor experience, not a taste experience. Because if I were to describe herbs for you, it would be sour, it would be tart, it would be bitter. That's generally, or dirt or dust, <laughs> that's generally what you get from herbs. So it's really this olfactory experience. So when I cook, I have to rely on established recipes. These are the herbs and these are the quantities that go with these types of food. It's not hard to figure out. You can always just, you know, reference some other recipe from some well-established chef to understand, okay, these complement the food that I'm cooking. So when I eat something that has herbs in it that I can't really taste, what happens is that it creates a complex taste. So something is, has a deeper taste to it rather than a surface, excuse me, a surface level taste. But I can't tell you there's rosemary in there. I don't know that that's thyme doing that or basil. So a lot of it is faith in just understanding that this is what the world says these herbs do. And I just keep my cooking really simple. I'm a paleo chef, so it's all about whole fresh foods. And so many paleo recipes are six ingredients. It's a very simple, clean type of cooking. And the taste profiles are just profoundly delicious. And I don't have to have a sense of smell to know that. I watched several of your videos, one of which focused on the battery of tests and consultations needed for you to obtain medical confirmation of your anosmia, which as a fringe benefit enables you to qualify for lifetime discounted access to national parks because you have a chronic and complete sensory disability. In addition to an MRI and physical exam, one of the tests you took during that process was the University of Pennsylvania Smell Identification Test, which is a scratch and sniff test of 40 smells. Incidentally, this is a test that can also be used with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease patients because the loss of smell can be linked to those conditions. 
In watching your content and speaking to you, you come across as pretty upbeat, which begs the question, do you have any glass half full or silver lining perspectives of anosmia, perhaps such as not being exposed to noxious or unpleasant smells? Well, yeah, there's a million ways for me to die on a daily basis <laughs> that I would never know about. And that's really the biggest impactful issue of anosmia, not just for congenitals, because if you become an acquired anosmic, those daily dangers will affect you as well. And if you speak to most anosmics, specifically congenitals, we have a count of how many times we've almost burnt down our house, how many times we've almost blown up the house, how many times we gave ourselves food poisoning, how many times we walked into rooms with noxious chemicals that we had no idea and anyone with a sense of smell would have run out. and We've been sitting there for hours wondering why we don't feel well and with headaches. So it is a daily impactful disability that can kill you. And when someone who has a sense of smell walks into any space in the world, whether it's indoors or outdoors, they get those sensory cues to understand danger. And that's the big deal with anosmia. We don't have those sensory cues. We don't have alarms. Yes, there's smoke alarms. Yes, there's combustible gas alarms. We have to rely on those working or being placed properly or being available or even existing in order for us to live independently and safely in that way. And for those of us who do live independently without those tools, we have to just check our daily environment, we have to safeguard as well as we can. We have to question if that food you think has been sitting there too long, you have to throw it away. I would never live with a gas stove. Never. That would kill me so fast. No, never. <laughs> I I can't, I don't know how people live by themselves with anosmia and gas stoves. That seems to me to be the most vulnerable of daily environments that would just easily blow you up. So that's the really, the really big issue. And when people talk about anosmia not being a disability, I do always like to point to the fact that if you have an inability to do something and that ability can cause you to die, that's a pretty big disability. And all we need is help. And it would be great if science and engineering could come together to create any kind of alarms, body alarms, home alarms, anything like that, food detectors to keep us safe because we're a vulnerable population. And even though I was born into it, people acquire it. And then as people age and as they get dementia or Alzheimer's, loss of smell is, is a huge marker of that. And so the vulnerable community, the vulnerable population has expanded and will continue to expand. And I think it would be a great service to us if science and technology could catch up to the need. Yeah, and that kind of ties into my next question as well. I was going to say the issue of loss of smell has perhaps gained some prominence or at least a bit more public awareness in association with COVID-19 because people stricken with the virus have had a side effect of losing their sense of smell sometimes for months. Although you've been aware of your condition from childhood, it was in adulthood that you learned the diagnostic term, and it's a condition that you've worked to raise awareness about it. In a recent Nature magazine article about the heightened awareness around loss of smell, researchers at Virginia Commonwealth University, which is not far from where we're recording this podcast, remark about rising investor interest in efforts to restore smell using implants and electric simulation to the brain. From your perspective, what do you hope comes out of this newfound attention and interest in research around olfactory issues? Ah, uh, yes. <clears throat> Here's the big catch-22. Everyone is now, of course, interested in anosmia and they're funding it and they're putting energy and big brains and money into understanding ways to help people with anosmia. But they're helping and funding and thinking and generating conversation around acquired anosmia, which is not the same thing as congenital. So for people with acquired anosmia to regain what they've lost, that's amazing. But if the conversation is around congenital anosmia, which it hardly ever is, we need an entirely different way to speak. We have a different language because we are not sitting in a situation of loss. We've never lost anything. We never had it to begin with. You can't give me an implant if I don't have olfactory bulbs or an olfactory tract or nerves. 
where's the science looking into that research? Everybody's pouring the energy into how to help parosmia and syntosmia and acquired anosmia. Everybody's really interested in that, which is wonderful. I just hope the conversation allows for the shift of attention to know that congenital anosmia exists and the experience and the dysfunction is entirely different. Even though the effect is the same, it's a wholly different experience. And I just keep holding my breath, waiting for science and technology to take a stand for the other side of anosmia. Thank you so much for sharing that, and thank you for being with us today. Before we go, we have a tradition on our podcast to ask each guest a pair of personal questions to give our audience a sense of who they are beyond the work they do. To keep things interesting, we've got a list of 10 questions from which you can choose, so if you would, could you pick two numbers between 1 and 10, and we'll ask you the corresponding questions. 5 and 7. Awesome. All right. Number 5. If you could spend the day with one person from history, living or otherwise, who would it be and why? I would spend the day with our forgotten mothers of our prehistoric Paleolithic past, the women who were responsible for painting the caves, those wonderful caves we see in France, like the Lascaux Cave. I would love to have a conversation. I don't know how well that conversation would go, grunts and pointing, but I would love to have the opportunity to speak with the women of our past who helped create some of the most indelible art that we still have today. That is such a fascinating and unique answer. I love that so much. Um, (laughs) And number seven, if you could choose one superpower to have or any one skill to instantly master, what would it be and why? (laughs) Well, some say my superpower is my inability to smell. I think that is my villain power. Because there's there's a lot of fun you can do with the inability to smell. But if I were to have a superpower, it would be invisibility for sure. Then I would be able to get in places that I want to get without people knowing me. Oh, my God, I have all the money in the world. Because I'd, I'd be able to sit around and watch where the bad people stash their money and then I'd steal it. Oh, it would be fabulous. Yeah, invisibility. I would be a superhero. I would just use it for personal gain. Alrighty, well that brings us to the close of another episode of the Virginia Hospital and Healthcare Association's Patients Come First podcast. If you like what you heard, please make sure to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and subscribe so you know new episodes are released. And we want to once again thank our guest, Dia Klein, for joining us today. So thank you. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me.